fishing, hunting, and har harvesting and gathering here for generations. May we learn from one another's stories so that we may nurture the relationship of the people of the Spokane tribe and to all those who share this. All right. Are there any um, changes for the proposed agenda or shall we consider it adopted? Okay. Hearing no changes, we will consider it adopted. All right. I need, um, uh, I take a motion to approve the March 2023 board minutes. So moved. Second. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. None are opposed. The motion passes. Uh, and now we need a motion for approval of the March 2023 bills and contributions. So moved. We should announce the amount. We usually do that. Yeah. yeah. When we make the motion, you usually read out the amount. Got it. You should be right on your agenda sheet. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about the one million six hundred yep. one million yep. six hundred sixty-two thousand and eighty-eight dollars and five cents on the eighteenth day of April, twenty twenty-three. All right, may I hear a second? Sure. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, no And now we have the financial report. Nicole. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, so for the library operations, we'll start um, and then we'll move on to Penny with the bond portion of the financial report. Um, so for our cash and investments trend for March, um, as of March closed, the library closed. Um, with the ability to pay 139 days of operating costs. So what, what that measurement is, it's an internal tracking tool to measure um, the, the, health of, the health of our fund balance. So we're taking the annual adopted expenditure budget and dividing up by the annual income to the library. So one day of operating costs for us is $34,212. That's, that's what that uh, measurement is, is indicating there. Um, so including the reserve for capital balance, which is about 1.2 million, and net of our encumbrances of 246,000. Our available cash and investments balance is currently at $6,1767. And for our expenditure trend, for March close, uh, we have spent and encumbered 23% of our annual expenditure budget so, uh, so far this year. And March, expense, at March expenses totaled $958,956. Our personnel costs were $654,325. Our, uh, our capital books and materials were $88,722. We paid a total of $56,377 for our uh, MK equipment checkout kiosk and our return station. Uh, we've got about 20 of those. Some of those do it, um, it include SPS, which they, they do cover their charge for that, but that's for the annual uh, service sub sub uh, subscription as well as the software li uh, licensing, which includes payment processing and all of that. Um, also, let's see, our, our, our security guard charges were $33,947. This does not yet include South Hill and Indian Trail. It does capture the additional security that we have down at Central right now, which was about $9,000 $9, for, for the month of February. Um, and then our utilities totaled $16,725. We also had interfund charges in the amount of $11,197, which does include one of the final first quarter charges. Um, On to the business office news. So over the past month, we've been working with our insurance agency, uh, Hub International, to obtain some quotes for insurance for the library. So these additional policies are for site, pol uh, site pollution and workplace violence. The site pollution basically is some extra liability coverage for us. Um, as, um, as an example, if there's um, co uh, any contaminants in one of our public restrooms and there's a subsequent lawsuit that we're involved in, it would, it would cover us there. And then for workplace violence, that one's, I guess, fairly self-explanatory, but it's just um, additional coverage for employees as well as for patrons that, that are on site. Um, and then another, another piece of news, 
Uh, this one's pretty exciting. So our accountant, Minnie Huang, uh, she recently earned a pin commemorating her five years of employment with the library. So I wanted to give a shout out to Minnie and, and congratulate and, and thank her for her service. And finally, uh, the city has officially uh, begun the 2024 budget process. This process is rolled out in various phases throughout the year. Um, it does start with our six-year capital improvement plan. Uh, we, we just uh, completed that last week. Um, we uh, typically, what we do for our internal process, I'll be budgeting with managers and with library staff for, for the next few months. And then I will bring, um, I will bring the budget, the 24 budget forward to board for approval in late summer, maybe early fall. And the city will adopt about early de uh, de December is, is typically when, when that goes through. And so I'd like to open up now for any questions before we move on to the bond. All right, thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Yeah. No, it was just in the initial process. Do you see or see any large changes from this past six year budget looking forward? Um, some we've we've pretty much accounted for the potential, especially with, with the inflation rate. We've mm -hmm. expected a large increase. We've also had a lot of um, growth in our business. We currently have 129 um, employees, whereas historically we've been in the high 80s low low 90s at fully staff so yes there are going to be some large changes but we will go through that through that process and explain explain everything that that, uh, that we first see once we once we bring that forward so, yeah. Yeah. thanks again any other questions all right thank you nicole uh is me on line with us Mm -hmm. Okay, good evening. Um, I wanted to lead off with um, last month I talked to you that, about the fact that I was creating an accounting uh, a cost center setup for our Nevada Street development and the kiosk installations. And so I thought it would be a good time to bring back the numbers that I presented at the at year end for December 2022. And so on the top half of that sheet, you're gonna see remaining budgets. And if you look over to the right, where we identified 1.57 million for kiosk installations, it was that discussion that kind of led us to uh, get board approval to, to develop Nevada and move forward with our installations. Most of that budget capacity was re residing in the PMO column. And for those of the, you that may not know, that's that's a non-site specific um, category. So if if it's not a if it's not direct for Shadle Central or otherwise, and it serves the branches all across the system, we carry that capacity in that column. So after we had um, approval to move forward, I I created a, a an accounting structure that you'll now see down below, and in the middle of that graph of that um, set of financials, you'll see Nevada plus three. Nevada will get one of the four kiosks. And then we have three locations, Yokes, Catholic Charities, and the third that's not assigned. So now you'll see how I've got that budget spread out in that column. That 1.5 is now in its own cost center. Now, uh, if you go to the next page, you'll see that I've got a financial, st the expenditure statement built for this site. If you've looked at our financial statement packages um, in the board packets in prior months, you would see a statement like this, an expenditure statement for each of the sites. And I have not, I used the Liberty Park and the, and the, um, the Hive new construction sites just as, a, as an estimator on how to allocate this out, we are not held um, in any way to, to, we can move around amongst these line items. They're not written in stone. And that's, that's routine, especially at this late year, fifth year of the uh, bond. Now this account code structure will also serve Nicole in operations. We built this in such a way that I can track the capital expenditures here. And then once it goes into service, Nicole will be able to use that same infrastructure and she'll have a, an, an expenditure statement to show you on the operations side as well. 
Um, one thing I wanted to remind you that remaining budgets in the bond is equal to unobligated cash. So our total unobligated cash at the end of March was $3 million. And that's distributed out in those columns um, where I pointed out the Nevada plus three. So any questions on, on that information? Okay, and then lastly, I just, uh, we didn't have any obligations executed under the special signing authority, so. Well, it looks like everything's on track, Penny, yeah. It is, yes, we're, we're, we're looking pretty good. Um, actually, you'll see a, a, there's a small expenditure in 2023 on, in that uh, expenditure statement, and that's for the feasibility study. Um, and then we've got some encumbrances um, of 47.30 each for each of the four, and that was for design um, uh, for each of the sites. Now, of course, we haven't realized those. That's just encumbered, and that would, of course, be a cost um, under the Group 4 slash Integris umbrella. So we have, um, we do have quotes in for the, the um, electrical installations at Yokes and Catholic Charities, but um, those weren't um, encumbered in March. You'll see those show up on the April uh, encumbrance column. Um, is Hill International also going to manage the kiosk placement projects or? Yes. Yes. All right, any other questions for Penny? All right, thank you, Penny. You bet, thank you. Okay, and now we're gonna move on to the bond construction project update, Lorraine. Good evening, um, I'm happy to be here to help uh, present where we are. We now have all branches open and operating. So uh, the main, um, you know, scope of the bond, we've, we've gotten through design, we've gotten through construction and you're now open. So the rest of the year, we're just gonna be doing some closeouts, some minor changes that, that the library has, you know, uh, expressed interest in, um, doing some warranty work. You know, there's some uh, follow-up on some of the furniture for Indian Trail and, and South Hill. Uh, shelving yet to be finished in May. So basically, um, you know, all the buildings are open. Yes, the kiosks are moving forward, but you know, the main tasks are done. So in general, uh, things are going well. Um, and um, since we're not having any other, um, you know, big projects to talk about, this will be our, my last board report. But of course, I'm you know, available to, uh, I will be working with Penny and Karis to, uh, you know, get all the clothes out and all the changes done to close out the bond program. Any questions? This is for Lorraine. All right, thank you, Lorraine. You're very welcome. Appreciated all the updates and the pictures. No problem. All right, the next on the item on the agenda is the chairman's report. And all I have this evening is I'd just like to welcome Danny to her first uh, first meeting with us. <laughs> and with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Andrew for the directorship. All right, thank you. Uh, a couple of highlights from the written report. One, just a reminder, Friends of the Library book sale, April 27th to 29th at the Shadow Park Library. Uh, similarly, a uh, library giving day was April 4th, uh, and that's run uh, with a huge amount of support from Skylar uh, through the Spokane Public Library Foundation. Uh, that raised nearly uh, $5,000 uh, this year. So uh, that's off, and thank you to Skylar, who isn't here today, uh, but congratulations uh, due towards the foundation as well. Uh, last week, I was in Beacom for the Library Council of Washington meeting. Uh, this is a group that is, advises the Secretary of State and State Librarian on uh, how to utilize LSTA funds, uh, which is federal dollars coming in from the Library Services Technology uh, Act 
uh, but is used for various uh, things in the library world. Uh, and one of the things that I had suggested that they focus on giving the issues that we're seeing on a national basis around safety, security, mental health, well-being, is to do some statewide investment on training uh, around those areas, as well as exploring uh, some uh, avenues like incident trackers uh, that all libraries could use uh, throughout the state because we're all facing these issues uh, statewide. Um, so be anxious to sit here uh, if they take that suggestion to heart. Um, as far as other things go, uh, just a heads up, Overdrive, which is one of our uh, big digital uh, media providers, they are uh, stopping the use of the Overdrive app and switching uh, to the Libby app, which has been around for a couple of years, uh, but communications uh, will be handling uh, that content for customers just to make sure that people are prepared. Our star spotlight for March uh, went to Amy Virchel. Uh, Amy is uh, at our Hilliard Library, and she's just been really instrumental in developing the partnership with Spokane Public Schools, uh, primar primarily around procedural uh, development, documenting procedures and transferring materials uh, between the two organizations. So that's a document that I imagine is going to organically grow as we're growing that business between uh, uh, schools and libraries, but really happy to have that uh, as a first start. Uh, and our libraries will be uh, utilized as uh, hosting uh, for the mayor's budget town halls in May. So Shadow Park, Hilliard, and Southville will all serve in that capacity uh, in May. And then just a reminder and thank you for the board retreat. Uh, May 2nd, 1 to 4, we'll be having that uh, at the Central Library. And then not part of the um, before, but we had just found this out uh, this morning. Uh, Bataya Streeter, who is our social services uh, manager, uh, pitched an idea with uh, Peer Spokane to better help uh, together for a grant to help increase capacity for social services downtown. We had originally applied for about $200,000 for the grant. Better Help Together said yes, and let's double it. Um, so this is a commitment for the next two years, uh, and we'll be able to place these services at Central and Shadow Park, as well as Liberty Park. Um, so we're really excited to get the support uh, from the community. Uh, this is a grant process that's it's very localized, and you have a lot of providers that are reviewing uh, the, 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 the grants. Uh, so to have that community buy-in, to, to recognize the importance of the work that we're doing uh, at Central, uh, and to recognize the importance of expanding it uh, is, is really great. We have not been doing this program, not even a year. Um, so uh, Bataya, that's real proof that Bataya has really you know, hit the ground running in trying to, to maximize community resources uh, in, in an approachable way for the public. So this will provide counseling services, mental health services, uh, as well as drug and addiction uh, services uh, for the community. Include an expansion of like library staff that would be like just thinking about Bataya and what her role is. Then now, in addition to that, managing community partnerships. Yeah, that's something that we'll have to address community partnerships uh, at, at a, a bigger, a bigger way later. Okay. Uh, but right now, this provides actual peer Spokane employees. Oh, uh, that would be oh, sweet. so. It does include a site supervisor. Okay. Um, so that part would be managed uh, by peer. Okay. In, in collaboration with uh, our so huge yeah. So a multi year, two year, at this point. So is it two hundred thousand each year? I believe. Do you know Paul? Two hundred thousand each year. Yeah, I think it went to three years as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So which was more than we we were asking for. But this is case management too. This is important to realize. We're carrying on sustaining a relationship with folks in need, which we don't have the capacity right now for. And so it's really a major, and it also doesn't add to FTEs for our staff right now, but it's perceptive that we need to think about it for the future. Too. And it's two, uh, two case managers and one supervisor from here to I'll watch over and report statistics and things. 
Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. And Zach, you're here just in time. Sorry for the tardy. Welcome. That's okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have any like direct things. Um, one thing coming up that should probably be in, uh, in awareness is the drug use uh, ordinance for consideration that would have like, library impact too. Uh, we're really just waiting on the legislature to see on what they're going to do first. So we'll know by the end of the week. Um, hopefully, in let's say extended session, but we haven't heard rumors that they're going to extend it. Um, potentially, the legislature would preempt anything the city does. So at the state level, yeah, yeah. preempting. Yeah, that makes sense. So we, uh, it was going to come for a vote this week, and we said let's just wait a week to see what they do. Um, there's also still a lot of questions. Yesterday at a briefing session, we had SPD there to give us updates about current policies around drug use or drug possession and what SPD does. And it was unclear um, if they're really do, taking advantage of all the tools that they have around drug possession right now. So right now they have the ability to confiscate drugs or paraphernalia, and they don't do that. And so it's a question of like, what would this ordinance do if you're not even doing it right now? Um, there's no real resolution. <laughs> so uh, but so that, that's, that's a question. Just wanted to talk about that since that's a uh, big big issue that's um, been up in the news a lot. Um, I, had a, I had a couple of questions, I guess, for both board and uh, staff side. First is, I was just wondering, um, how have you been resolving issues of bathroom use and issues because STA is having a lot of issues and we're having people come to uh, council meetings complaining about STA. So I was like, a lot of overlapping population would be at the central library. So I wasn't sure what you all have done. So yeah. we have a security that pays particular attention, uh, especially on the first floor restroom. So we're very just vigilance. Um, in, in, but it's not checking people in and out. No. Sort of As STA has closed down their first floor. Yes. And let one person in at a time. Yeah. So yeah. you're just more vigilant. We're just, we, we just try to keep it. And, and uh, you know, there's a, there is, I think, some ownership on part of some of the users where they will come and report uh, if they are seeing any activity going on. Do you have something to add, Karen? Uh, just to say the key difference between us and even STA is that they have that check-in system. We have a dedicated guard that we brought on to monitor that area. For floor area. Well, the, the front door and the bathroom. So we and we also started propping the doors open as a best practice. Andrew saw from some West Side libraries, and we saw that to be really effective. Uh, we were considering measures similar to what STA is doing, but once we implemented these, we didn't see the need, or we haven't seen it yet. So it's been effective so far, or it's mitigated, really reduced, reduced a lot of our issues. It hasn't disappeared. Uh, that's helpful context, because we're getting conversations about that. And then uh, with STA, there's a couple um, things that we're voting on this week at STA that is always helpful for input and so one of those is central city line uh and we're talking about promotional period for city line and there's basically really three proposals that we're looking at so city line is going to launch in march or july july 15th and we're looking at a promotional period for free rides um there's one proposal through july for a couple weeks july through labor day july through the end of the holidays or july through may of 2024 so i guess that's more than three um May 2024 has come up because that's when the services will increase. Right now it's supposed to be 15 minute service and it'll increase to seven and a half minutes when they are able to staff up. So that's the target date for it. Um, and it gives a nice long window, gets people through the winter. I'm, I'm going reverse order here. Um, there's costs, but the costs with STA are all, they have like built in budget for city line that they're actually coming in way under. So potentially to use it there. Um, the next one was, what did I say, holidays. So again, getting through the holidays, peak period through downtown. Um, September, the advantage is there. Uh, it gets to the start of the school year for the SEC. Um, all SEC students already get free transit, um, but it'd be guests and people that go there. Uh, enforcement actually won't start until October when they have people on the buses to enforce it. They won't have that stepped up until October. 
And then the two weeks was just like a, a quick splash to try to get attention to them. So I don't know if people had input on that. Always helps. And then the second issue, actually, I'll stick with that first. If there's some feedback. I don't know if this is normal. I just have to I'm just throwing it in there if I got the microphone. <laughs> Yeah. I think their goal is to increase consistent ridership that they should, if and they have the funds to do it, to do it for the full year. I know that when they launched the app to have that, like they did it for a month and we rode the bus way more. Um, and sort of like we're telling everybody like, oh, did you pay? Because <laughs> you just download the app and then you get it for the free month. Because <laughs> I don't think that the publication on that part was as strong as it could be. And so especially if they're looking for building that, that core group of people who will use that service so that it is this center line that they hope it to be that I would strongly lean towards having it be for the year or till May 2024. Thoughts? I'd like to see it be free forever. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know I realize there's financial costs to that. Yeah. But one of the things that I always appreciated in Seattle was that you know you pay when you get on and then you pay when you get off so that they created that free zone in the downtown. Mm -hmm. And that was just wonderful to be able to get around your downtown core. Um, without feeling like you had to, you know, really in that book or way. And I, and I heard about the city line. I thought, oh, wow, it would be great because someday it was something like that. In somewhat relation to that, we are uh, in discussion with SC about how the library could serve as uh, a place where you who do not have ID or are not in the school system can get access okay. to the youth bus pass mm -hmm. um so we're scheduling that uh meeting sometime in i think in may or okay may, so would this come out of your budget or the st budget? so it's just a a way to help uh, bridge that id gap would it also be conversation that anybody even if they were associated to a school could sign up there or mm -hmm. discussions discussions i know that the legislature is just about to pass like it, it has to go back for concurrence, but uh, an amendment that says that free transit has to be low barrier accessibility. And so what does that look like? Is yeah. So they're going to need to look at that as STA. Yeah. And we're happy to play a partner in, in providing access to it. That service so it just makes sense from a community standpoint. I'll be so as one question. And then uh, I. That kind of goes to my next one, unless anyone had other feelings about. I won't put you on blast as a public position here. I think it's already there. <laughs> but another um, one is um, connect cards and selling connect cards and an administrative fee. I don't know if you've had conversations around that, but there's retailers what's, what's that the do. Card? Um, that's the bus path, the, oh. the cards themselves. Um, and they've expanded to retail networks like Safeways and stuff, or you can go online or you can go to the plaza. But looking at, I don't know if that's come up in conversation, uh, but they're looking at charging $5 for a bus card to get it. And then we're discussing if it should come with an automatic $5 back or not, and if there should be a replacement card cost to it. Um, they're proposing $5 costs. There's a way of the, five, the replacement cost where there's a $1 proposal too as a kind of a compromise. I don't know if people have thoughts about that. I'm just using this as my time to get feedback. <laughs> Obviously free for community is always preferred. <laughs> yeah, especially if we're talking about something so core as transportation. Um, but it's not unheard of in cities like in Chicago they had they implemented the go card and you would charge ten dollars and then when you were done with your go card you could return it and you would get reimbursed that ten dollars. Um, but I mean, what's the re replacement card policy for the library? Freeze. <laughs> Do you have this? Does it happen often for replacement cards? Or I mean, often enough. I mean, I think some pe people wanted to switch out cards when we got the new art assigned to them. But it's you know they're not smart cards. Right. They're they're dumb cards. <laughs> there, there's not an RFID connection or anything. I think that I assume that the, yeah. the STA, which is costly. But we 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 would rather not be in our organization. We would rather not be taking cash. Right, right. It, it, it's, Stay it's, out of that. It's, it's more costly for us to do those transactions than not. So, well, feel free to reach out. Just kind of 
Yeah. Stakeholder and engagement. That's <laughs> public policy. All right, excellent. Uh, any questions for that? Thank you. Okay, and now we have the communication reports. Amanda? Hi. Um, so a quick report for you all tonight. We, as Andrew mentioned, we had a successful library giving day campaign thanks to partnership um, with the foundation and Skylar and we raised more than $5,000. I don't know if Andrew mentioned that, but pretty cool. That was our goal. So we exceeded our goal. Um, at the South Hill and Indian Trail openings, if you missed it, we did a tote bank pop up. So one thing that we've been tossing around in our team is how we can sell merchandise to customers to get our brand out there, give people an opportunity to buy tote bags, buy shirts, and um, working around how we can do that in the best way. And so as a low barrier way of doing that, we've been doing these pop-up shops at the two openings. And our next pop-up shop will be at the Friends of the Library book sale. So we'll be selling those there um, in late April. And then a kind of cool thing happened where the Thrive Center, uh, we've been partnering with them a lot, giving them translated materials so that, oh, and the Thrive Center is um, a center with Ukrainian refugees. It's housed, it's in that hotel that's down on Cowley. Um, and so um, we've been partnering with them, taking them activated library cards, taking them translated materials, and they actually sent someone over from their organization to film an in-language Russian video in Russian, because a lot of Ukrainians speak both Russian and Ukrainian. So she spoke Russian in this video and gave a tour of the library. Um, and it's been really successful. We've gotten lots of views on it and we've been using it as well as them. Um, and it just kind of has inspired us. We've been, as you know, we've been doing a lot of language access work and doing translated materials. So we're talking now about potentially doing some more in-language videos. Um, so that'll be cool and coming up. Our top posts on social for the entire month were uh, about South Hill opening on all of our channels on Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter, and then also had some fun content on TikTok about podcasting, um, Women's History Month reads, so not all about South Hill out there, although one of the videos was really popular there about South Hill opening. And then um, great local media coverage this month. Um, on a number of topics, but the, the kind of notable piece that came out uh, was a story from Vital City, New York City, um, that Andrew is heavily featured in right at the beginning, and it's all about restorative justice programs and, you know, libraries being more than books for communities that need um, access to justice opportunities. So, um, that concludes the report. Any questions? Thank you, Amanda. Okay, thank you, Amanda. And now we have a programming report from Jason Johnson. Jason. I'm going to stand up. Stand back here. Everybody. Um, my name is Jason Johnson. I'm the community engagement manager for Spokane Public Library. And when that means that title means a lot of different things in a lot of different organizations for us, it means that I oversee all of our public events and programming system wise. Um, One second, I'm going to share it on here too. Um, today, though, we're going to talk a little bit about a thing that's been in uh, the works for a very long time, and we're still not quite there yet. Thing that we're, for lack of a better term, calling the value score. But uh, hey, don't, you're ruining the surprise. <laughs> and what this is, in a nutshell, is a way that we're going to use uh, bring use this to evaluate the value and the the success of our programs and help us make decisions on what programs we do moving forward. Um, and what we maybe drop that we have been doing in favor of other things like that. You can move to the next slide now. A um, little background on library programming measurement for as long as you can, can imagine. Here's a beautiful program of a guy playing Slide the Hat in 1926 at the, you know, this, I don't know what that picture is, but attendance has been the only, uh, the only way we've measured program success well not the only the main way that it's been made so you have a program you have this many people show up oh 50 people show up for that that was great 30 for that not as good and it doesn't tell you a lot of things that you need to know about that program it really undervalues small programs and one-on-ones things that are designed for a smaller group when you're looking at the total numbers you'll say like oh man that one only had five people in it this one had a hundred we're always going to do the hundred but that we don't want that to be the case necessarily 
And it's really just looking at the output, which is the number of people coming there instead of the outcomes of what does that program do for the community. And um, this is where the value score will come in to help us there. You have a ton of data that was in there. That's all of our programs and uh, scores. The score numbers are really just noisy and weird right now. We're really just trying to calibrate how to score these, what works, but I'll run you through some stuff. I want to give you a quick overview of the vision for programming at Spokane Public Library, which has changed in the last few years. We really want to specialize and go deep into specialized topics that we have um, worked with. So we have an arts educator, a music educator, a video production educator, a business librarian, local history specialist, writing specialist, current affairs, environment, STEM, teens, early learners. These are the topics that we will be doing programs on. And if you go to the next slide, really, we want to be great at the things that we choose, which is those things, instead of being mediocre at everything and spreading ourselves too thin. So we've hired people that are experts, or we've identified people that are experts in their topics, and they do end up programming on their subjects. And what we hope from this is that it'll these programs provide more value per attendee. By doing these specialized things, by nature, we are actually shrinking the attendance in some of them we can't do a hands-on arts activity for kids for 400 kids it's got to be there's limited registration but we're going to prove is that the value that's provided to each kid in there far outweighs the the lot so as a result of that discussion and that introspection then mm -hmm. what you're saying is that you've cut down on all of this to condense it into this so you're able to better target what you're doing here for you know, yeah you're yeah doing? instead of doing real surface level things like on all the topics we can we're really just hammering in on the on the, we have experts that can do really to get really deep dive into like i say business research or local history and do programming based around those things we still do some of the traditional a lot of the traditional library things and we do work with places like humanities washington or snap or other organizations we bring in experts in other fields to do the programming but we're really trying to focus heavily on our staff that we have and the, the skills that they have and really educating the community in that sense um go ahead so the value store explained sort of uh i like this guy here um what is it um, it, it's an, like I said, it's an evaluation tool for programs and events. What we're trying to do with this is pre-bake in the outcomes measure. So there's libraries have basically used one method of outcomes measures forever, which is a survey at the end of the event, and you get basically the same information from that survey every single time. And they say that was great, and you say our programs are great, and that's so it's not really that useful in a lot of ways. But it's really hard for us. I'm not going to follow. If a 10 year old comes in, takes guitar lessons for two months, we're not going to follow him around for six years to see if he's, his math skills have improved and his science skills have been great or if confidence has improved. But we know through studies that that stuff does happen. We also know that class size matters, which is a big deal in the schools and with us. So we know that one on one instruction is better on the whole than large group instruction people the kid will get more out of it so we're baking in a lot of these things into the program before we even start it so we know we're making decisions the right way and you'll hacking is encouraged which means it, there's a you'll i haven't given the full quiz that you get here but there's basically a quiz you go through before you start your program you answer a bunch of questions and you're given a score of that program um and if you say, man, I wish I had a higher score, you go back and you say, well, I'm going to add, I'm going to make sure that I give clear learning objectives at the beginning of this event, or I'm going to have a way for them to follow up with me. So you're going to basically just add more value to your program to get your score up. And all you're doing is uh, increasing the value of that program. It can move on. Mm -hmm. um, so the questions that we ask and the things that we value are, like I said, class size, does it utilize a library resource or their clear learning objectives? Will you be creating something in that event with your hands? Is there a skill that you're learning and walking away with? Does the program involve group discussion? Are there local experts that come in? Do we collaborate with an outside organization? Um, is there a way for the uh, customer or the attendee to follow up easily if they need to? Does this work? Does this promote diversity? Are we working with a diverse audience? Are we working with historically underrepresented communities? 
Um, this is providing a platform for a pre-existing event, but we're just amplifying it by having it in our space. Is this helping to build communities? And is this actually providing a service that would be cost prohibitive for most people to do? So if you're sitting down with Mark Pond and the Business Research Center, and he puts you on the Bloomberg terminal, and you get all this research, you're obviously not going to subscribe to a Bloomberg for, for what we pay for it. I don't know if I want to say it out loud, but, um, <laughs> but that's stuff I got, or access to the audio engineering things, or access to the video cameras and all that stuff that you probably wouldn't be, most people can't afford going to spend $15,000 to buy brand new camera gear to learn how to do it. So we value, we do, you plug in study questions on all this and you get a score out of it. And that's what we're trying to calibrate what that score should be and the weight of all these values. But can move on there. And all that being said about how numbers of attendees and all that doesn't tell you anything, that's what I'm going to show you here because we're, the scores will just kind of be noise. But in the month of March alone, there are overall 272 events. That includes 110 one on one sessions with Mark Pond business stuff. There's one on one lessons with music lessons. There's audio or a uh, book and engineer in the audio engineering department. And there's video production stuff. But 272 events, 4,330 people came to events in our libraries in March alone. 68 of those were adult events that we had throughout the whole system, um, 1,600 people. 48 youth events, and then story times are 46 of those. Story times are, are bread and butter, but they'll always be the highest number of attendees we do, and that's great. Um, I don't know that I should say this, but I was trying to figure out in other libraries uh, what they did in March. And a lot of them, you can't look back at their calendar in the past. Seattle Public Library let me do that. Um, and they did a total, overall, a total of about 50 programs. And 30 of those were every day they have AARP and to do tax aid. So really, they did like 20 pro public programs in the month of March. So that I could see. Maybe there's stuff that's not on there. Boise, you, I want to look at Boise, but they don't let you look in the past. Um, well, all that being said, we're doing a ton of things here. Build Learning is a huge focus of this library. So it's uh, there's a lot going on. If you want to move on? I was going to highlight a few new programs real quick and some adult programs um, just to give you a taste of what we do. These pictures are not not reflective of what I'm about to say. These are just cool pictures of kids. Um, we have our STEM librarian who did a Botley a coding robot program that kid, and um, for kids five to 10. Um, our teen librarian does this thing called Amago. Is that how you pronounce it? Which stands for uh, hanging out, messing around, geeking out, really providing a- um, I do that at work all day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to count you on our stats. <laughs> so creating a community for middle schoolers is a real big focus of the teen um, program. So it's really just giving them a place, and that's at um, Hilliard, to go hang out and do stuff there. Um, Mason, who was our youth environmentalist specialist, who you met, I believe, a couple or last month, the Seed Bombs program. I think he talked about that. So we went. And then Remalisa is our youth art specialist. And they did a painting with nature program using like turmeric, turmeric, turmeric. Mm -hmm. Can I say the word? Beets, coffee. We had to do something with the business office around purchasing those things because you're not allowed to buy food for programs. This <laughs> wasn't. We weren't feeding it to anyone. They're painting with it. And if you move on there, and Vanessa Strange, who is our adult services manager oversees a lot of the adult programming. Um, some things that she would like me to highlight is um, we have some local author talk and tours in the Inland Northwest Special Collections. There's Sharma Shields, who's our writing education specialist. Um, we had Jess Walter in there. So people got to sit down and learn from Jess how he uses or how he's used the Inland Northwest Special Collections for researching his writing. And that was a, we had people trying to get onto that wait list. So there's a long wait list and uh, people pounding down the doors to get in to see him. And we also um, want to talk about something that our current affairs uh, specialist Shane did was a program with range podcasts. They did a thing on how do you how journal it's a big journalism project that they're doing and trying to train people to be journalists locally. So you're reporting on your own community instead of having to go to uh, 
some school elsewhere and then report on a community in like Dayton, Ohio that you've never been in. Um, and he had a public, how to file public records requests like a journalist uh, program. The thing you see in the middle is actually a, we partnered with the Spokesman Review for a um, Northwest Passages program, their book club there. But we do all kinds of things. Um, hit the button there. <laughs> so if you have any questions, you can uh, ask them now. I know it's a lot of information in that packet too, so. Well, I, I just really appreciated how the figuring out the score as you're scoring in advance is driving people to build a better program. That's the intent. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're, this is early days of, of actually scoring things, and there's things on there you look at the numbers like that that, that don't make sense, and we got to figure out why certain we got to see what why certain things aren't getting scored as high as we think they should. Yeah. Yeah. You manage it if you don't measure it. Yeah. Any other questions for Jason? Are there examples of other library systems that use this type of tool to measure them? I wish. Um, I don't. Go not that your job easier. I mean, there's people that have some kind of rubrics of yeah. what areas they'll do programming in and like it about it, but not quite this level. So it's kind of we're not blazing a trail for this. So hopefully we'll get it figured out and then we'll present on it at a conference and everybody starts doing it. Yeah. We really mean it's a programming. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to have some like this in this whole thing. Yeah, that comparison to Seattle, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though, I don't know of what's going on. I mean, maybe they have stuff that's not on their calendar, but it seemed pretty, pretty radical. Well, then, do other libraries have the programming assigned to a devoted manager versus, I mean, I, I feel like that also is probably putting us in a category. I think the rules that we choose are unique in that we have these specialists. So a lot of libraries will choose to hire a librarian who their skill set is sort of their hobby. Mm -hmm. So they also do video where we sort of flip that on the head and would rather bring that expertise in and we can teach you how to work in the library, you know, rather than it just seems more impactful uh, to be able to do something. We know a lot of libraries will, they want to do music lessons. They might hire somebody to do music lessons for two weeks. And then that's, that's we did music lessons mm -hmm. instead of really digging in deep to those things. So we're, we are pretty unique and we're fortunate that we, we can do this sort of thing. Uh, David S. Pumpkins aside, the, I, I wonder how you're judging all of these as you're doing them. So for example, if you have, an audience for a Jess Walter doing a talk and you're getting that immediate feedback as opposed to yeah. something you're working on over the course of a couple of months. How are you comparing the apples and oranges? Yeah. Um, well, do you mean like the feedback afterwards? I mean, we still take, I mean, we, I, we aren't really doing surveys at the moment. We could still do those, like I said, but really, I have our experts really trying to pick out what they're doing and knowing Jess Walter is going to be massively popular. Let's bring him in. Um, but I don't know that we are really doing that. Yeah, I think that there's still an element that we're still building as we're going, um, which is sometimes good uh, mm -hmm. in, in free. But I, I think that we'll be figuring that out as we get settled of you know what is that feedback that we need that's, that's impactful as far as we will know. One of the things we'll look at too is this: the score. I didn't mention this. The score you get is the score. Then you multi. You get that multiplied by the attendees at the event. So if you're doing an event, even if you're having an amazing score, but it's supposed to be for a large group, and you're getting ten people showing up regularly, we're gonna. It's gonna show up in in the total score. That okay, this is great. Either we need to figure out a way to get more people here, or this is a great idea, but we're going to abandon it because it's not it's not getting the value we need. How annoying or much of a barrier do you think it would be if you had an option for people to like scan their library card so that you could see for like thinking about I'm a recurring yeah, which checking in of, yeah like I I go to story time regularly mm -hmm. the fact that I go to story time regularly is making that program even more impactful because it's a recurring mm -hmm. event and it's a skill set that's being built like it's we I love that you're undertaking this and it seems like it's 
Okay. So we, yeah. yeah, we experimented with people checking in at events yeah. during a, some a previous organizational goal we had. Um, the technology wasn't quite where we needed it to make it easy. Yeah. It was a lot of people don't want to like they like their privacy and don't. Sure. They think we're going to use that information. We're way. I don't think it's a bad idea to know who's going, but it could be an optional thing. Yeah. Even if there was like a scanner outside, like my kids fight to see who's going to beep the card to check something out, and if they get to beep it when they come in the room, and it doesn't have. To, it's not a mandatory thing, but it's a thing that you could do. I don't know. Cheers. You buy that for us next time. It does need to beep. Yeah, right. 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 Because the machines do not beep. But. Oh, we can fix that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> just a point of clarification, too, just to give a, a sense of the scope. These are just programs at the libraries. It doesn't include someone signs up for the Hive and it's getting some sort of community event. Uh, they didn't go through our channels as far as sponsorship or anything like that. So the the breadth of what we're um, able to have an impact in the you know, community is is much bigger. And I had a question for you because I don't know the answer. But how do we collect? Uh, how do we how how do we collect residents at the high artists and residents Is that considered a program? or something um our artists and residents do provide public programs which we measure the success of those we haven't put the high application process you consider a public program or they would have to actually do the public program in order to be in this system they it's when they do a program um i don't know how i would score them yeah some for six months if they get a point so, points every single day <laughs> um no yeah they when they they provide multiple programs a month each of them at the hive so those do they do provide service there for us so i don't know i have to think about it yeah that's i'll just add the point of community groups i was here at the new trail neighborhood council meeting last week and it was a full room like almost 40 people they're super excited to be back in the library because they were across the street at the church for the last the previous month and there were like 10 people there so just the change of venue was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> like, wow, which is great. Like it's engaging the whole neighborhood again because they've been spread out. So it was super exciting to have the space for the first month. Yeah. Not to put this on you, but it would be really interesting to think about what in those partnerships that have been cultivated, what those metrics are and how they compare to the metrics of programming that comes from the library to be able to tell that story. Like, this is what we do. We do this deep dive and we can do this. We can focus on this because we also have these really meaningful partnerships that have these larger outreaches that are doing their own work. And so we don't have to put on these mass events because we have partners who are doing that. Well, I think the ones Andrew is more for sure people that do, they don't even tell us they're doing it. They, yeah. uh, they use our meeting room for a craft fair or whatever it is. We do the partnerships that we have that we actually do programming with do get counted into this score itself because they're being basically there's a host from the one of our staff members is forging that partnership, hosting them at the event, helping them out with that sort of thing. Even if they're doing all the content of it, it's still developing that relationship, yeah. finding it out. This is a lot of what Shane does in the current affairs is identifying people in the community and putting them on the stage and, and it's, it's been very he's only been around for six months or so and really knocking it out of the park so, right. any other questions i had another question oh. um kind of going back to sorry. <laughs> uh, in this report we're just talking about language access what does programming look like for English language learners or individuals who don't speak English as their primary language. Um, it doesn't look like much. Um, we do not do a lot of it at this point. I mean, we have services and things that we can do and translate materials, but it's something that we we do have ASL interpreters at right. certain events. Um, but yeah, we haven't really dove into language programming. I think that's it's something that we need to develop. Yeah. Yes. Well, it'd be it's interesting to see as you continue to do more outreach and pull in some of these populations, you know, having that on the forefront of the planning or yeah. specific program. Yeah. For yeah, I know, for example, Andy Rumsey, who's our music education specialist, is actually working with the Ukrainian family on music lessons. So he's been brushing up on some music-related terms in Ukrainian that he can say to them. So because they 
very little English in there, but yeah, it's something we would definitely need to grow. I think it's another thing that because the rooms are available, like there are groups that use the spaces mm -hmm. to then facilitate like short times in Spanish or uh, so that uh, although it might not come from the library, it's still accessible in that regard that yeah. the space is available. Imagine if we did something with the colleges and universities, they could probably provide some type of translation. Any other questions for Jason? Jason, thank you. Thanks, thank you, Jason. All right, and now we're moving on to new business. We have the capital bond fund final acceptance for security solutions. Penny. Oh, thank you. Yes, um, this agenda item is a request to the board to grant final acceptance of the public works contract with Security Solutions Northwest. Uh, final acceptance is basically the closing out of a public works contract. Um, in February 2021, the board approved the execution of the contract for the purchase and installation of a user access control system across all branches. That's that's the remote lock system that allows users to enter the meeting rooms. The work has all been completed and the, and the final cost with sales tax was $148,000, $304. Um, we're currently, re we're holding retainage in the amount of $13,612.70. This was a fairly simple contract, no subcontractors. Um, they've already filed all their certified payrolls in their affidavit of wages paid with labor and industries. So this request is for the board to formally accept the public works project. And uh, we will be able to release uh, retainage to Security Solutions Northwest as soon as we get the release letters from the th three state agencies. All right, any questions for Penny on the action? All right, we, I would entertain a motion. Um, I move that we accept the public works project under contract with Security Solutions Northwest and approve the release of uh, retainage after the receipt of the release letters from the three state agencies. All right. Seconded. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing <clears throat> none, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And now we have the election of officers and persons. All right. According to our bylaws, April is when we need to choose new officers for the Board of Trustees. We are looking to elect a chair and a vice chair for 2023-2024. I would like to put out there that it might make sense to have Laura serve as chair for another year, even though she's been there for two years, just given the nature of all the business. But happy to do so if there's anyone interested in vice chair i move that we elect uh lara as chair and gary as vice chair for 2023 and 2024 i second all right it's been moved and seconded all in favor aye, aye. And now we have the appointment of a finance committee. Yep. So traditionally, we will have two trustees serve as a subcommittee to uh, work with us in the nitty gritty of building the budget for the next year. Um, so that should say 2024 budget uh, on the agenda. Uh, so we are looking for two volunteers to serve on the finance subcommittee. Mary? I'm happy to do it as well. Mary and Laura? Do we need to? Yep, so we need a motion. So move. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I mean, and now we have a uh, to the Friends of the Library. Also, according to our bylaws, uh, we need to establish a trustee liaison to the Friends of the Spokane Public Library. This was a role formerly filled by Jim Kirshner, who stepped off the board. Um, so they've been without a liaison. Uh, 
process during this time. So we are looking for one trustee to serve as that liaison. Yes. Yes. I am happy to fill whatever role needs to be filled. <laughs> All right. Annie has raised their hand. A lot of the meetings are online. Oh, and summer's off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we do we need to pass uh, Danny yes. as yes. liaison? So uh, I need a motion to appoint Danny as liaison to friends. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. And then we have the Public Library Foundation liaison. So also looking for a trustee to serve as the liaison to the foundation. Look at that shoddy, shoddy work on this agenda item. Uh, liaison to the found, uh, Spokane Public Library Foundation. And I think- Yeah, I'd be happy to do this one, yeah. I'd be interested in that. Okay. All right, so we need a motion to appoint Shelby. So moved. Second. All right, we've been seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Everyone's favorite. Um, finally, we have yeah, the director of value. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would like two <laughs> trustees to serve on the <laughs> 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 We'd like, like it completed by uh, December of 2023 to allow for. Uh, budgetary adjustments possibly uh, for next year. Uh, but yes, we need two trustees. I saw Mary raise their hand. Anyone want to learn the ropes? Possibly one of the new trustees on the evaluation? Thank you all. This is the easiest time we've ever had selecting liaisons. Yeah. All right, so we need a motion to appoint Mary and Gary for the Dover Evaluation Committee. So moved. Second. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. The motion passes. Now, do we have any other additional agenda items or changes we need to do now? Hearing none. All right. We'll move on. Uh, anybody sign up for public time? Nope. Okay. Our next regular meeting will be Tuesday, May 16th at the South Hill Library. And we aren't having an session, executive session today. So with that, I would say that we are adjourned.